this guy is an activated intermediate, like the last one was. So we saw acetyl-CoA, I said we had an activated intermediate. We'll see in this case how that activated intermediate, is, the energy of it is used to do something, and we'll see that in the next reaction. We've now gone through our second oxidation. We're now down to a four carbon molecule. It went from a five to a four. And these are the only two decarboxylations that happen in the citric acid cycle. The only two decarboxylations that happen in the citric acid cycle. The rest of the citric acid cycle is rearranging everything to get back to oxaloacetate. So this has four carbons. Oxaloacetate has four carbons. We'll see how we get there. This guy is useful for making hemoglobin, it turns out. Succinyl CoA is used in, ma in making the globin, I'm sorry, the heme part of hemoglobin. Okay. Let's see what happens next. We've got an activated intermediate. That activated intermediate in the next reaction is going to give up its energy and look what it does. Here is this very energetic molecule. It is giving up its energy, and it's giving up its energy such that it's actually doing something unusual. It's combining a phosphate with GDP to make GTP. In this case, it's not donating itself to anything. This is an odd use of an, inter of an activated intermediate, but the energy is used of this. The product of this reaction is succinate. And the name of this enzyme is a little surprising. Look at that name of that enzyme. What does that enzyme name sound like? It sounds like it's making succinyl-CoA, right? It is. It's named for the reverse reaction. Well, how did that come about? Well, you have to realize that before we put together all these metabolic pathways, everybody studied individual reactions. Here's an enzyme study this reaction. So the person who isolated this enzyme was studying the reaction going to the left. Oh, wow, look, I know how to make succinyl-CoA. I've got succinyl-CoA synthetase. Reactions are reversible, of course. Right? And so that's what this person uh, named it. So it's called synth succinyl-CoA synthetase, but in the citric acid cycle, the reaction that what we're studying is going to the right. Succinate's a four-carbon compound. It's a perfectly symmetrical carbon. If you're memorizing structures, look at that. Carboxyl, carbon, carbon, carboxyl. Very simple to memorize. Maybe I should make you guys memorize these structures. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yes. The delta Gs of these two reactions are, are reasonably close to zero. They are. So that's partly because we have a lot of energy in that activated intermediate bond. Not a big change. For most of the reactions of the citric acid cycle, there's only two that vary very much in terms of delta G zero prime. The first one was that citrate synthase, which was fairly negative. The last one we're going to see is fairly positive. Okay, there's succinate. Uh, succinate gets oxidized in the next step, and this next step of oxidation is not one that uses NAD. It uses FAD. Why does it use FAD instead of NAD? Well, this is a different type of oxidation than we've been doing. The other oxidations that you saw, at least today, all involved decarboxylation. This guy does not involve decarboxylation. It actually involves extracting protons and electrons from right here between these two carbons. That is a difficult thing to do. It takes something with a lot of electron drawing power to do it. And FAD turns out to have enough electron drawing power to make that happen. The product of that reaction is a molecule with a double bond called fumarate. Fumarate, you'll notice, has a trans bond like that. We also get FADH2 out of there. Now, I'm going to, point, I'm going to remind you of this reaction in a couple of days when we talk about fatty acid oxidation. Because fatty acid oxidation uses FAD for a similar reaction. And I'm going to draw parallels to this reaction when I talk about that one. In fatty acid oxidation, we see a very similar thing happen. We have a single bond going to a double bond. And we see production of FADH2. Right? This enzyme has the name of fumarase. It's making fumarate. I'm 
sorry, I, I've got that wrong. I said it early. Fumarase is the next enzyme, sorry. This guy is called succinate dehydrogenase. Sorry, I should have realized that. It's a dehydrogenase because it's an oxidation reaction. Succinate dehydrogenase. Okay. I'm just excited for that fumarase reaction. I know you guys are. And so we go to that fumarase reaction. And that fumarase reaction is shown right here. This is catalyzed by the enzyme fumarase. Fumarase catalyzes the addition of water to the double bond. One of the carbons gets a hydroxyl. The other carbon gets the hydrogen. And we make this molecule called malate. This is the fumarase reaction. As you know from your organic chemistry, water adds very easily across the double bond. And when it does that, we've got this guy right here. This is an asymmetric carbon, and yes, this is in the L configuration. I don't emphasize that too much, but you realize, of course, there's four different things attached there. So they only go on there in one way, making L malate. Okay. What we will think of as the last reaction of the citric acid cycle, because we're getting back to exaloacetate, is this guy right here, which is catalyzed by malate dehydrogenase. This is a very unusual reaction. Malate dehydrogenase is catalyzing a reaction that's oxidizing an alcohol to a ketone. That's not unusual. What's unusual is the fact that this guy has a very positive delta G zero prime. Not very many oxidation reactions have that. This guy has a very positive delta G zero prime. Most oxidation reactions have a very negative delta G zero prime. This guy has a very positive. The product is NADH and exaloacetate. Now, if this has a very positive delta G zero prime, if I start with equal amounts of exaloacetate and malate, what's going to happen in this reaction? It's going to make more malate, right? How would I make this reaction going, go forwards? By taking away exaloacetate, right? That's what happens in the next reaction. Citrate synthase, remember, has a very negative delta G zero prime. It's going to grab exaloacetate and move it forwards. So that very negative delta G zero prime in the first reaction is helping to pull this reaction forwards. The combination of the two make it basically all overall even. Now, we've gone all the way around the citric acid cycle. We've made three NADHs. We've made one FADH2, and we've made one GTP. That was for one acetyl-CoA. If we count the NADH that we made to decarboxylate the pyruvate, tallying it up for glucose, starting with pyruvate, we now have to add on four more NADHs. I'm sorry, we have to, uh, four for each one. We have to add on eight more NADHs. We have to add on two FADH2s and two GTPs. Okay, so we're making a lot. We're making a lot of stuff. If we had, we counted the NADHs from glucose in glycolysis, we've added two more NADHs, which now means we have 10 NADHs, two FADH2s, two GTPs, and two ATPs from glycolysis, right? A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, a lot of energy has been made. Those will ultimately get converted into all into ATP in oxidative phosphorylation. When that happens, we'll end up with a total of approximately 38 ATPs for the complete oxidation of glucose. Okay, very cool. All right, I'm doing all the talking. Questions about what I've had to say? Yes, sir. Um, all right, I've got two of the NADHs down. But is is a is there an NADH produced from the alpha uh, ketoglutarate? Yes. Okay. So oxidation of alpha ketoglutarate uh, is a decarboxyl is an oxi oxidative decarboxylation that produces an NADH two. So I'll, I'll refresh your memories. All right. Where do we where do we produce the NADH the NADHs from what I've said today? The first one's produced in the in the oxidative decarboxylation of pyruvate by pyruvate dehydrogenase. Second one was the oxidative decarboxylation of isocitrate by isocitrate dehydrogenase. The third one was by the oxidative decarboxylation of alpha ketoglutarate by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Okay. The fourth NADH that was produced 
was produced by the oxida oxidation of malate by malate dehydrogenase. So there's your four NADHs right there. The one FADH2 that was produced came from the oxidation of succinate by succinate dehydrogenase. And the one GTP that was made was made by the um, catalysis of succinyl-CoA synthetase. Okay, a lot of, lot of stuff there. But a lot of energy there. Cells use all this energy to do good things, like making A's on your exams. Okay. All right. That is the, those are the reactions of the citric acid cycle. Control. Oh, my God. Look at this mess of control. The control of this reaction is very, very simple. Especially, I make it a lot simpler than the book is because the book really goes a bit overboard, in my opinion. <coughs> There's really only one factor that determines the control of this cycle. That's the availability of NAD and FAD. The availability of NAD and FAD is the most important determinant of this cycle. What determines if we have NAD and FAD? How much oxygen we've got. You betcha. Okay. Now, that's, in a nutshell, how this guy's controlled. If we don't have NAD, this reaction isn't going to go. If we don't have NAD, these reactions aren't going to go. If we don't have FAD, this reaction isn't going to go. Okay, so all these things require NAD or FAD. Now you might say, well, how about that NAD that you can produce in fermentation? Well, we can only produce one NAD for each fermentation. So that wouldn't be enough to keep the cycle going, for one. Second, that NAD is being produced in the cytoplasm. It's not being produced in the mitochondrion, and the, the, the NAD cannot cross the boundary. So we could have all the NAD we wanted to in the cytoplasm. It's not going to do us any good in the mitochondrion if the mitochondria don't have NAD. Now, we'll see that there are various factors that influence the amount of NAD. It's not just oxygen, but oxygen is one of the factors that can determine that. Not exercising is another. We'll see how that works. Okay? All right. Yes? Good question. So there is a, a connection. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking too much. Yes, there is um, a definite connection with FAD uh, in addition to NAD. They both tie into what's called the electron transport system. And the electron transport system requires oxygen. If we run out of oxygen, we're going to have just as much FADH2 as we're going to have NADH. Same problem. Um, and so, as I said, two factors influence how much NAD and FAD we have. One is how much oxygen we have, and the other is how much exercise we get. We'll see how that goes. Okay? Yes, Stuart. Gluconeogenesis. Yeah. It's not a coenzyme. It is a factor. It's an allosteric factor. I didn't talk about that. But it, uh, just, just because you've asked the question, I'll tell you. The acetyl CoA uh, allosterically affects the pyruvate carboxylase. I didn't want to complicate that for you, so I didn't point that out. But, you, but it was on the figure. You saw it, yeah. Is it what? No, the pyruvate carboxylase is, is in the mitochondria, if you recall. Yeah. So what was your question? Are these intermediates existing for long periods of time? Well, this is going pretty quickly if you are um, exercising. If you're not exercising, then we'll see that things, things change. So let, me, let me save that answer that question until we get to electron transport. Okay. Yes, Sue. Sure. It is like a roundabout, exactly. So